Well, thank As you. a gazelle. Oh, yeah, a very fat gazelle. <laughs> Me, me, me. Me, 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 me. Thank you. Me, me, me. This is like when you go to a fancy show, you know, and they hush and turn down the lights. And <gasps> Anticipation. I love that leather couch out there. The one on the porch or this one? I love that one. Yeah, that one yeah. sucks in some heavy, heavy hitters. It does, it yeah. does. I love sitting on that couch. I have not done it yet, this, this yeah, festival. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Three, two, one. We're live. All right. It's kind of weird to think that in this day and age, we can be broadcasting right now on Facebook Live like we have done all week. And we will be doing tomorrow morning from the Summit Bechtel Reserve. We're going to do kind of a, little, a mini big sit and broadcast so some people can bird with us virtually. Uh, so we'll be doing that from the Summit. We've done that a few times. But it, it does wig me out a little bit to think that anybody anywhere in the world could be sharing this experience with us. And that is really cool. And they do. When you look at the feed, we can see who's joining us from where and it's pretty exciting I have had people come up to me and the last person I would ever expect come up to me and say I watched that Facebook thing the other day about birds that was amazing so that's why we do it because we have no idea where that impact may land and but we do know that it does land and I think that falls in with the conversation about what can I do to change my world for the better. And, it's, and my answer for that is anything and everything. But most importantly, in sharing, share your enthusiasm. And you're going to get the weird phone calls and the bad phone pictures you know, what's this bird, and no one, you know, Julie couldn't even identify from the photograph, but <laughs> it's worth it because eventually those people build an interest and enthusiasm. If you don't know something, if you don't love something, you can't protect it, you can't work for it. So share your love in the weirdest and wildest places you can imagine. And this little thing we call bird watching and um, ecology will expand. We've got living proof of it right here in this room. Mm -hmm. So I would like to introduce a dear friend and a family member, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've uh, done w wonderful uh, trips with our kids when they were younger. We spent a lot of time traveling as families, and I really miss that and hope we can do it again with our adult children as, th as they kind of settle down into adulthood. Yeah, yeah. I miss that yeah. um, travel time, yeah. adventures. Yeah. So Julie is a, a very accomplished artist, author, and field guide, amazing in the field love being able to spend time with you oh, on field trips yeah. and um, just wish I had a, an nth of your uh, intellect and enthusiasm for all of this to be able to produce all of this is just <laughs> mind-boggling to me and thank you for sharing it with us and I hope you continue to share it with us in years to come Julie was our first speaker at our first festival. Wow. <laughs> no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Julie Zikavus. I love you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Wow, it's so great, great to be here. I love it here. Love. Why am I not getting a picture? I'll, I'll kill some lights. No, I don't think it's that. Hang on just a second. I got a dither. Dithering. Hmm. This let me exit. It's on. No. Let me let me just hit play again okay. and see if I can. No. I may not be hooked up. 
Yeah, you're in here. Well, that's very odd. Hang that's on. That's the sound. That's the speaker. Right. Ooh, thank yeah. you. Pete. Yeah. No, no, no. She's got it. She's got it. But I'm just trying to. I had a picture before. I had a picture before. Um, let me exit. And There's nothing happening here. So no, got no. We've got projection. I've got a. Here, let me unplug this. Mm -hmm. And then I will hit play again. And then I will plug this in. Make sure this is actually, actually plugged in. So you can wear both of these? Wait, we, we don't even have a show yet, darling. I know. We're, we're going to get one, though. Well, I, I started out with one. I got this. You work with her. We had something happen in a minute ago. Yeah. Um, unplug it and plug it back into your computer. I did. Okay. I did. I did that. But I will do it now. Oh, hang on. Yeah, that's where we wanted to get to. So if you haven't been on a trip with me, um, I am a certified yoga I can see what I'm doing. What I like to do most in my classes is work. So right now I'd like to share a little breath okay. with you to calm myself down and maybe there we are. Okay. Something happened. No, I just I have yes, I have to wear this one. I and yes, this one this is the one. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. This one on my pocket? Okay. But I'm gonna have to use it for the sound. And it'll no, it'll come through the system. No, but I mean the sound coming out of my computer. Yeah, it'll Okay. Cool. We'll see. And then yeah. Exhale through your mouth. Okay, ready? You can do that three times at your own pace because we all breathe differently. So exhale first. And then in through the nose, halfway. Couple more of those. We have a show. <laughs> All right. It's a great, great honor to be here again with my beloved friends. I always feel like they're holding a family reunion just for me. And, you know, I think we all feel that way when we come here and all the repeat offenders who do this every year. It's just so great. Um, I have a funny little show for you now about the weird stuff I've learned about Bluebird since 1982, which is when I started working with them uh, in a serious way. Uh, I run 26 Bluebird boxes, and uh, every time I open one up, I learn some iota of information that I didn't know before. So th this is, I, I developed this for actually for Bluebird societies. I've spoken to two in Virginia and North Carolina recently, and I'm probably going to give this to some other Bluebird groups. But I thought it would be of interest to you guys because um, in looking at one species very closely, you can learn a lot about birds in general. So this is called, Have You Ever Wondered? I've done a lot of bluebird art. This is done for the Virginia Bluebird Society. Uh, they wanted me to do a poster that sort of summed up a lot of different things about bluebirds. And, uh, and also this little painting of the male wing waving is kind of a favorite. I have it in my bedroom at home. Um, now, some of you may have seen my book, Baby Birds, which was kind of a, a book that snuck up on me. I didn't really realize I was writing a book for 13 years. Um, all I knew is that I was compelled to paint baby birds, which are blobby and pink, and not something that a lot of people want to hang on their walls. Uh, but I, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by them, like this yellow-billed cuckoo, which has one of the most incredible life cycles of any bird I can think of. It has the largest egg relative to its body size of any bird in North America. And it's basically the kiwi of North America. But there's this enormous egg. And from this, from this giant egg comes a giant chick that by age two days is perching on the rim of the nest and snapping at passing insects at two days of age. So obviously I had to write this book because nobody knows this stuff and I really wanted to share it. 
So uh, this is just a quick run through the development of cardinals, which this is day zero through day eight. And these are all painted from life, uh, you know, with the baby right there. And bluebirds were my entry drug to painting baby birds because it was bluebirds who gave me the idea that I could even do it. And um, basically in handling the birds and doing so many different manipulative things with them in the course of managing them, I realized that you can take a baby bird out of a nest and take it into your studio for 40 minutes and paint a few studies of it and put it back in the nest and everything's fine as long as you feed it age-appropriate food and keep it warm and treat it nicely. Um, nobody bats an eye. So I thought, okay, well, I can do that with bluebirds. I might be able to do that with a lot of other species. In the end, I painted 17 different species of birds from day hatch to fledging, and sometimes beyond. So much of what I've learned about bluebirds um, and the management of their boxes has been learned by doing it wrong. Um, I don't pretend to be an oracle. I just know that I have an experiment experimentational sort of bent and um, I like to ask what would happen if. So uh, just a simple intro into this. If you ever wondered if some birds are just naturally better nest builders than other individual birds. This is my champion female who started off with a moss foundation that was stolen from a chickadee that was nesting in the box and then she went further and made an entire nest of the pink petioles of red maple seeds, oh, wow. which I thought was just the most fabulous looking nest ever, and just love it. Um, this nest on the left was constructed next to a hunting cabin where people had been slaughtering deer, and so the nest is made up almost entirely of deer hair, which must have been the best insulated warmest nest in Ohio, so pretty awesome. But are some birds, on the converse, are they lousy nest builders? I have a chickadee in my driveway, had for years, who would build a lovely little nest and then excavate so deeply into the box that she wound up laying her eggs on the bare wooden floor of the box, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. That was not a good thing. And you can see there I'm lifting up the nest and there sit the eggs on the floor of the box. Well, each year I would go out and I'd take the eggs out and I would make her a new foundation, a new mattress, and I'd put it in under her little excavated ring of nesting material, and everything would be fine. The chicks would be on a soft, downy bed. But then I realized that the problem was mine, because this box is too shallow for a chickadee. And she doesn't have any way in her brain to make sense of a box that's only four inches deep. She needs about a six to eight inch deep cavity. As soon as I put a proper box up for her, the problem ended. So like many things that we perceive to be problems with birds, it's actually something that we're doing that is causing the behavior. So she wasn't a lousy nest builder. I was a lousy landlord. Chickadees, um, I often, uh, in fact, I am here just by the skin of my teeth because we had three solid days of rain and temperatures hovering around 40. I'm sure a lot of you have enjoyed that weather this past early week. And so up until a half hour before I left for this festival, I was hand feeding baby bluebirds in the boxes because I couldn't stand to see them die in that weather when the parents couldn't find the insects. So in this particular spring, I had a chickadee nest that I was doing that with. And I had to take the chickadee nest out of the box every couple of hours to feed the babies. Well, of course, it was going to fall apart because it's made of fuzz. So I made a cardboard insert for the, for the nest so I could just slide it out feed the babies, stick it back in. They all made it. So uh, the other thing that happens um, in addition to inclement weather uh, with uh, nesting birds in boxes is nasty, nasty parasites. And one of them is a uh, bluebird blowfly, Protocalifora sialia. There is also a Protocalifora species that's specific to tree swallows. And you can see a maggot hanging off the beak of this poor little tree swallow. So basically the, and there's my little daughter in the background. Phoebe. Um, basically, the life cycle of this thing is the, the fly lays its egg in the nest as the bluebird or swallow is laying her eggs. The maggots hatch in the nest material. They crawl up at night. They suck the blood of the baby bluebirds or swallows. And then they crawl back down into the nesting material to the bottom in the daylight. So they do their nasty work at night when the mother bluebird who's sitting on the babies isn't going to be aware it's happening. It's very clever. 
So I don't like this. So what I do is take them out of the box. Um, this is a handful of the engorged maggots and a bad infestation in a box can run to 200, 250 maggots in a box all sucking on maybe four or five babies. As you can imagine, that can really set them back. So I can actually smell a box. As soon as I open it, I can smell them in there. I know when, they're, when it's infested. And they're all down at the bottom there. So what I do is right, right around Easter, just when I'm preparing the kids' Easter baskets, and my kids are 23 and 26, and I still do this, um, because they need their peeps. And they're, um, you know, now they're making them in maple syrup flavor and all kinds of things like that. Um, so I, I get the great candy. But I like to put it in natural grass. So I go out in our meadow before the grass gets green, and I gather all the dead winter grass, and I fill feed sacks with it. And then, um, oops, hang on. Yeah, the, my favorite grass is hair grass, which is uh, Deschampsia cespitosa, which is a very, very soft, fine grass. Uh, and I actually cultivate patches of it to use for my bluebird nests. So what I have is this ready supply of this beautiful dry grass. It's almost like hay. And I can make replacement nests just by winding it around my hand. And I make a beautiful nest. And then I take out the nasty one and throw it away. And, um, and I replace the nest. So um, I've had some really cool discoveries uh, in opening these boxes. And I very rarely have house wrens in my boxes, which is a good thing because house wrens are super destructive to uh, nesting bluebirds. They will pierce eggs and throw them out. They will cover a nest with sticks and take over the box. But I had these crazy things. And on this little sketch page, two of them, I had a, a runt uh, baby who was not feathering out and who was doing very poorly in this house wren nest. And it was very small and behind the others. And one day I looked in the box and I found that one of the adults had stuffed a four inch long um, walking stick into its bill in an apparent attempt to kill it, <laughs> which is very weird. So I took, the, I took the walking stick out, but the baby was gone the next day. So it looked like attempted infanticide to me. The other thing that was going on in this nest is I found these growths on the babies. You can see those sort of cocoa bean looking things on their heads and wings. And um, these turn out to be the maggots of an unknown fly. Well, um, I wasn't about to let that go unidentified because most of the, the, the Proto-California species that I've shown you do not burrow under the skin. They are, they are blowflies. They just suck the blood and then they crawl off. These things were actually firmly embedded under the skin of the wrens. So Phoebe and I did a little field surgery and we, we pulled them out with tweezers. I put the maggots in a vial and sealed it and they pupated, and then I put them in a larger jar, and when the flies came out of the pupae, I sent the flies to a guy in Pulley Up, Washington, to identify, and it turned out to be Protocalifora deceptor, which is a subtropical and tropical species of blowfly that was never known to Ohio. So that's kind of cool. I mean, that's a, I live for that stuff, you know, to find out something that adds even a dribble of knowledge to the, the general body. Uh, there's another common uh, parasite of, of bluebirds and swallows, which is uh, chicken mites. And they get these actually from domestic chickens, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll pick up a feather in a hen yard that's infested with mites, and they'll bring it in to line their nest. And that's how you get chicken mites in Phoebe nests, and bluebird nests, and tree swallow nests especially. So my special protocol with that is I, I will not use pesticides in a baby bird nest, just across the board there. Metabolism is too high, their skin is so thin, and you can't put chemicals in a bluebird box, although people do. People swear by seven dust in their boxes. <laughs> I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Oh, they do fine. Yeah, right. Have you done any follow-up there? Um, so anyway, what I do is I take the nest out, I dump that in a bucket, I put the babies in a little strawberry box with white Kleenex, and the mites crawl off the babies onto the white Kleenex. I think they're attracted to the UV light in the white Kleenex. It's awesome. And then while they're over there getting deloused or demited, I take a, my Yeti thermos, which is absolutely full of boiling water, and I dash out the box with boiling water. And then I wipe it out with paper towels. I put my fresh hair grass nest in there. I put the babies back in. We're good to go.
mite free or nearly. So um, I put a lot of effort into making, and believe it or not, that is me, although I don't recognize myself in that picture. Um, and that's also Liam, <laughs> who is now 6'2". Uh, but I put a lot of effort into making baffles for my boxes because I don't want predators to ever get up the, the stem of the box to, the, to eat the babies. So I thought to myself, well, if I've put up one box on a post, why couldn't I make a condo and put up two boxes on the same post? And it worked like a charm. I got a Carolina chickadee in the bottom box and bluebirds in the top box. And I thought, wow, man, look at my productivity. Until I saw the chickadee exit the bluebird box with an egg in her bill. She decided she didn't want upstairs neighbors. She didn't like the music they were playing. And they were loud at night. And she decided to kick them out. I didn't even know a chickadee could carry a bluebird egg in its bill until I saw it happen. So this is a little painting of that moment, and I realized that that was a really dumb idea. But I wouldn't have known it was a dumb idea until I did it. Sometimes bluebirds go bad. Yes, they are the bird of happiness. But they can also be, I mean, like people, they can just go off their nut and they can be kind of crazy. And I had this bluebird who decided that she needed to take over a box which had hatching baby chickadees in it. It was a bad moment for me when I realized that bluebirds could turn into killers. So this bluebird was pounding away on the heads of these baby chickadees. That was unacceptable to me. So I immediately made a whole excluder out of a piece of a yogurt container, which is merely a one and one eighth inch diameter hole in the plastic. I duct taped that over the one and a half inch hole in the box so the bluebird could no longer gain entry. The chickadees could go in and out, but the bluebird couldn't get in. It didn't work. Because the bluebird then camped on the roof of the box for eight hours, beating up the chickadees every time they tried to feed their young. She was cracked. There was something wrong with this bluebird. So Phoebe and I actually sat out. We brought a picnic out, and we sat next to the box all day, me feeding the chickadees every hour, the babies in the box, Waving away the bluebird, encouraging the chickadees, it, it didn't work. The, the chickadee could never make it past this crazy female bluebird. So after eight hours, I, I conceded defeat. And uh, I realized that I needed to adopt these chickadees out to another chickadee mother who could care for them. So I happened to have in my backyard a nest of chickadee eggs that were just about to hatch. Chickadees seem to nest fairly synchronously, so they all kind of build their nests and nest at the same time. So I thought, well, let's add the poor remaining babies from this beleaguered box to this clutch. So look here, you can see these teeny weeny little babies with the red, reddish gapes, and then the larger babies with the orange gapes are the imports. And if anybody could pull this off, this chickadee mother could. Nine babies. And um, you can see that my, my fosters are getting their black caps, and while the others are quite a bit smaller. And then it really became apparent as they grew. A pretty, I just loved this. It was, it was such a way to make lemonade out of lemons. And you can see those foster babies are just hulking, and the other babies are trying so hard to catch up. But they stayed in the nest until everybody was ready to go. And the bluebirds were foiled um, in their attempt to destroy this nest. The chickadees all fledged fine. Um, and then I took the whole excluder off, and the bluebird didn't even nest in the box. She just wanted to kill something, I guess. It was so awful. So what I learned from this is that if you're lucky enough to get a chickadee in one of your bluebird boxes, protect it. Put a whole excluder on as soon as the female is incubating. She'll go in and out. The bluebird will never be able to get in. Protect those chickadees. And the reason I say this is there are not as many chickadees now as there are bluebirds. Chickadees are extremely susceptible to West Nile virus, and they get hit very hard by it. I have no chickadees nesting in my boxes this year for the first time. So that upsets me. And so I will do anything that it takes to protect chickadees who choose to nest in my bluebird boxes. The other thing is chickadees take, they have one try. They will nest once in the spring and that's it. They will not try to nest in June or July or August the way bluebirds will. 
So chickadees have one go, and if they don't get to nest at the right time of year, they don't try again. So it must be something in their social structure or the abundance or, ability, or their ability to find food or however long they have to teach their young to do all the cool things chickadees do. I don't know what it is, but they only do one try per season. So I like to sort of try to dispel bluebird myopia whenever it comes up. And I absolutely love this folk art box, which clearly says bluebirds only, and the tree swallows are not listening. So um, I have actually talked to people who get upset when anything but a bluebird nests in their boxes. And um, I don't quite know where to start with people like that, but I understand if it's a house sparrow, you don't let that happen. Uh, but come on. Um, tree swallows, they need help, they need loves, love and homes and all that. So why would you not be open to the experience of having chickadees nest in your box? They build the softest nest in the world of all kinds of interesting furs like possum and squirrel. And uh, tree swallows are a total delight. I mean, they will sit on the box as you walk up to it. The female will sit with her little head sticking out of the hole like a little turtle. And um, they lay these gorgeous pink eggs. And they bring the most interesting feathers into their nest. I have a wood duck flank feather from a drake wood duck that I got out of a tree swallow nest. So, and here she's found a guinea fowl feather. This is how we get chicken mites. <laughs> um, but I just love to see how they construct their nests. And I, I love tree swallows. So, and this, of course, is the crown jewel in any of my nest boxes, was a white-breasted nuthatch who nested in a little box um, down on my clothesline pole, completely unexpected, and there's a whole, I could write a little book about that nuthatch nest. It was so wonderful. There they are growing up. I painted them, even though the book had already been published, I painted, I have a beautiful nuthatch page, and uh, watched them grow up. I did not know what this nest was when I saw this in my box. I, it had a bunch of crunchy dead leaves in it, and I didn't know of a bird that did that. And that's because I had only had one tufted titmouse nested in my boxes in now 30, 30 years uh, in Ohio. I'd only had one tufted titmouse. So these are tufted titmice, and that's a tufted titmouse nest. And this is the display, the defense display of a tufted titmouse who is very pissed off. Isn't she awesome? <laughs> I couldn't close that box fast enough. She was scaring me. Um, yeah, that's the snake strike display of a tufted titmouse. And if you stick your hand into a nest box and you get bitten, there's a titmouse in there, I'll guarantee you. So listen to Mrs. Titmouse, avoid bluebird myopia. You'll have much more fun if you let the biodiversity happen and let other things nest there. So a lot of my um, quest in t caring for bluebirds has been the search for the perfect predator baffle. And um, I mentioned that I had a sort of a, a love of experimentation, and this is where it really got the better of me. I wanted to design the perfect predator baffle. And that turned out to be a real thing, because I started my experimentation in Connecticut, and what I did was I looked at what people were recommending for raccoon baffling uh, to keep them from climbing the pole and eating the nests. And the first thing, and the easiest thing that everybody was you know, crowing about in the 80s was, oh, axle grease on a metal pole. They'll never get up it. Great. So I thought, okay, that sounds easy and cheap. So I put a metal pole uh, for my feeder support. I greased it up with fresh axle grease. I put chicken carcass on top of the, you know, cooked chicken carcass on top of the feeder pole. And I let the raccoons try to get up that pole. Well, for a whole night, they climbed up and slid down. And then the second night, I saw the big coon, the big mama, pat her hands in dirt and go right up the pole. <laughs> no axle grease. So on to, on to plan B. So I liken the whole mounted predator guards like this knoll guard, which is a hardware cloth cage around the hole, which is supposed to deter predators. I liken that to putting an ambulance at the bottom of a steep cliff. 
Once the raccoon is on your box, you have lost the game. It's, it's going to get in there. Um, it's better to put a guardrail on the top of the cliff than to park ambulances at the bottom waiting for people to drive over it. So the thing is to keep them from ever getting up the pole. So I wrote a booklet called Enjoying Bluebirds More for Birdwatchers Digest Press, and I wrote it in about 1994, I think, 93 or 94. And the whole reason I did it was because Bill talked me into it and because I wanted to get this baffle plan out there. So stovepipe baffle is what I settled on, the one that'll wobble um, as the best raccoon deterrent. And um, I borrowed from a, a, a man who just recently passed away named Ron Kingston from the Virginia Bluebird Society. He was a lovely man. And he had designed this baffle and I just kind of improved on it a little bit. I used a, a ready-made cap for the 24-inch stovepipe that you can buy right at Lowe's. And I suspended it from hanger iron so it wobbles and it, it works really well. Um, the interesting thing about baffling raccoons that I found out was in testing all these predator baffles, I tried PVC, I tried different diameters of stovepipe. I had this cohort of raccoons in my yard who could get over anything I put on the pole. Starting with the axle grease and ending with an eight inch diameter, 24 inch baffle. So what I'd done was I'd essentially trained them how to get over baffles. <laughs> awesome. So I had a problem. I then had to trap all those coons and transport them to far, far away to get them the hell out of my yard because my yard was full of bluebird boxes with stovepipe baffles. But here's the cool thing. All of those educated coons never once tried to get up any of my baffled poles. And that is because they had never received a reward by doing so. They knew there was chicken on top of the feeder pole but they didn't know there was candy in the bluebird boxes. So what I'm saying is if you have a stovepipe baffle on a bluebird box and you've never let a coon gain access, that baffle's gonna work just fine. So that, that was what I learned. Um, I did a few more experiments recently um, with a, uh, a um, this, this one I love, um, spinning peanut jars on a very thin clothesline. And this little gal just danced over that. And the reason she did, as you can see, she has a teat there, and you can't get between a lactating female raccoon and her meal. And having lactated myself, don't get between me and dinner when, when it's time to eat. Um, so basically, this is, this is a super predator, a lactating female coon. And I, I, I cannot keep them off the feeder. Um, but I do keep them off my bluebird boxes with this simple baffle design. So the key is to always put a baffle on and never let them up and you'll be all set. So that's what the first thing I tell people and they say, I put a bluebird box up in my yard. I said, did you put it on a tree? Yep, it's right on a tree in my backyard. And I say, take it down. <laughs> because you don't want the heartbreak of finding that every coon has climbed up and gotten into your box. So I say, unless you're willing to put it on a baffled metal pole, don't even do it. Don't even do it. And I amuse myself every year by getting my yearly snake photos of these black rat snakes in my yard who try to get up the, the stovepipe baffle, and they can't. But of course, the bluebirds tell me they're out there. They're, they're you know, scolding and chittering and flying and diving. And I love to take these pictures of disappointed rat snakes. And then I, I move them a short distance away just to let them know that it's a bad idea to do that. So, <laughs> In the last three years, I have discovered a brand new problem on my trail, and that is the nightmare nest box predator, the one that cannot be stopped by any means. And I found this out two years ago when I walked up to this beautiful box along my driveway in July, and I saw blood on the outside of the box. Just a little blood, but you don't want to ever see blood on the outside of a bird box. And inside was one thoroughly traumatized alive baby and four who were definitely not alive. And they had been rendered asunder. They were in pieces. I knew from this that this was not the work of a snake because snakes work clean. They swallow their prey whole and leave. I knew it had to be a rodent, but I knew it couldn't be a mouse because they couldn't get past the stovepipe baffle. 
I knew it couldn't be a mouse because they couldn't have leapt from the nearby trees. What was it? Well, it was a flying squirrel. So here you've got something with a taste for fresh meat, knows about baby birds and eggs, and it flies. So it can come down on your box from the top. And they are adorable. But that very fall, that same box was filled up with 25 hickory nuts. And the only animal on the planet that could have gotten 25 hickory nuts into a baffled box is a flying squirrel. So that's how I knew what I was dealing with. So that next spring, I had to move three quarters of my boxes into the middle of the nearest clearing, which was harder than it sounds because I live in a heavily wooded area. And I had all my boxes on the edges of the woods, kind of looking out onto other people's property, right? So I moved them and um, got them away from these little adorable devils. And I haven't had any more flying squirrel predation, but I just want you to know that they're out there and they will get your birds if you're not careful. This was news to many of the bluebirders I talked to. Um, this is just a little painting I did of their adaptations for they even have a winglet on the, on the end of the wing which, with a little bone called a calcar in it, which, op, which functions exactly like a winglet on an airplane to slow the eddy or to reduce the eddy at the end of the wing. So you've got to get them out in the field. This is just a little video of my butterfly meadow last uh, August. That's wild bergamot. And the new location of that box is now as far out into this little meadow as I could get it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite places to be in July and August. It's pretty awesome. Now we're getting down to what's going on, was going on right now before I came here. Ohio and West Virginia in spring is a cruel, cruel place. And I almost invariably have a snowstorm or at least, you know, several days of frigid rain while there are babies and eggs in my boxes. And it's no fun. Um, and so I had, uh, 2021 was a particularly cruel spring. 2020 was horrible. 2021 was just about as bad. And I had a female bluebird leave five eggs that were, had been incubated for 11 days. Total incubation period is 14 days. So these were near-term eggs, and she left them completely cold as a stone in 30-degree weather. So I was curious, knowing that this female bluebird was already building in another box, so she was never coming back. I was curious what would happen if I incubated those eggs, and I'd deal with what happened later. I wanted to know if they would even hatch. They had been cold for four days. So... Um, I gave them, I candled them first, and on the right is a fertile egg at day 11, and on the left is an infertile egg. And you can candle eggs with your iPhone. It's simple as can be. You put the egg in your, in your finger like this. You lay it on top of the flashlight, and you get that view. So this is my egg candler, my, my camera, my note taker, everything. And um, so I knew these eggs were good. And I gave them to a friend who is crazier than me. And he incubated them. And I will be damned if they didn't all hatch. After having been almost full term and then being cold for four days, I'm talking almost freezing. But the problem was, when the babies hatched, they were so pathetically emaciated that three of them didn't make it. They didn't even have the strength to gape for food. You can see how thin they are. They, they look horrible. So what I surmised was that they had used up their egg resources just trying to stay alive in those temperatures, right? However, there was one little dude who raised his head and begged, and I wept, yes I did, and began to feed him and named him Miracle. And um, I suddenly had a baby bluebird on my hands. 
I knew that I, I was not up to the task of raising it. So I, because super, super tiny, newly hatched birds are really, really hard to feed and really, really hard to raise. Having killed many of them, I know this. So I put it immediately in the box of uh, another pair that was incubating near-term eggs. And they started feeding that thing, and look how plump it is. Just boom, just like it's fine. Um, so that was a good stopgap. Um, and here is uh, Miracle is this bird here. Look at the size of the head. So when the host eggs hatched, Miracle was already like twice to three times the size of those babies. It was incredible. But I was desperate because I was feeding all these boxes of baby bloopers and I couldn't even think about raising one. So I was like, you guys take care of this thing. So there's Miracle, <laughs> the big blue one with two of the host chicks. But everything's going well, you know, it's not a problem. And uh, Miracle starts to feather out here. And these are still in pin feathers but you can see the feathers have broken the sheaths here. I think Miracle is a female. And um, she had a terrible start, so she was a little bit behind. So I wasn't too worried about it. So here's May 16, and it's day 18 for Miracle, who is looking at me. Hello, mama. And the babies are obviously a little bit behind her. She's technically old enough to fledge, but she wound up waiting for the host chicks to catch up. She stayed in the box until she was 22 days old, and they fledged all together. Oh, wow. And it was fabulous. So from that one little bird, I learned so much. I learned that, yes, they can hatch after being abandoned and chilled. Yes, they actually can survive if they're lucky and they had a well-provisioned egg. Yes, you can put them in a, in a younger clutch, and, the, and the, they will wait for the babies to catch up until they fledge, just like the chickadees did, right? So that was really, really cool. Um, there's, when you're working with wildlife, when you're doing rehab, and I'm licensed in rehab, there's a lot of death. You have to deal with it. It's just part of, part of the thing. And on these horrible springs, I will open boxes and I will find cold chicks. How do you tell if one is still alive? So this chick looked really bad, very pallid, very stiff and no sign of a heartbeat. It's 9.15 a.m. And I have the car radio going and the car cranked up to 90 degrees. And I'm trying to warm this little thing up. Its parents have abandoned it. They can't feed it in this weather. So, the thing to do is put it in the brocubator. <laughs> the brocubator is something every woman knows about. And put that baby down your shirt. After only 30 minutes in Zix brocubator, it was a different story. No, I'm not crying. Okay, so another baby bluebird I had to do something with because I had brought it back to life, right? So, kind of skinny. Um, I did my best by this bird for about three days. I fed it and fed it until I could get it strong enough to get it into another nest. So I dumped it into a nest box. You look a lot better than when I put you in, but you're still skinny. And they fed it. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah. I have an infertile pair sitting on five eggs for 20 days, and you're going to be their miracle child. You get raised all by yourself with all the food any baby bluebird could need, and you're going to catch up. <laughs> yeah, I had to have a plan. And then this, I think, um, yeah, here we go. So I dropped, yeah, so initially what I did was I dropped it into a nest with like five or six babies in it, and they fed it for a while, but it wasn't doing great. So I took it to this nest of this infertile female who just sits patiently on her eggs and they never hatch. Um, I go to pick it up and this baby yep, knows me and she's like, please feed me. They're not giving me enough here. So 
So I take her and get her in the car, and here's Curtis. This dog, you've met him, he's a hunting dog. He was chained in a front yard in Gallipoli, Ohio, for four years of his life until I adopted him. Can you imagine chaining that dog? I don't even know where he is, but you know, he, he's around. Um, and, and so he had a prey drive you wouldn't believe. He would chase anything, kill anything. But he learned real fast to leave mama's birds alone. Oh my goodness, it's a baby bird. I'm not even going to look at it. <laughs> I'm just going to lie down here. I don't even want to see that thing. <laughs> he is the best boy. Um, yeah, so we took him over. We took the baby over to this infertile nest. And look at this baby. It's like somebody inflated him with a bike pump. This female was like, there's been a miracle, dear. Uh, one of our eggs hatched this very large chick. And so they fed, and I named him Roquefort Eddie. And um, this is five days later, April, the fattest baby bluebird in the world. I finally took the infertile eggs out. And really, I've just never seen a, a more obese bluebird. But I'm sure that is a good thing. It's just like, it's like an overstuffed mount, you know. Um, so I've learned to treasure the infertile females that occasionally I find on my trail because they're always ready to foster. They're always waiting for that adoptee. Um, yeah, so what do you do when it snows in April or May and there are babies in your boxes? So this is what I've been doing just the first, the few days next, you know, right before this festival. And this is why this feels like a vacation to me. I'm so happy to be here and not doing what I was doing there. So um, when, when it's rainy and cold or snowy in April and May, um, and you see birds sitting in the middle of the road, what they're doing is picking up earthworms, because that's the only thing they can find. So like four days ago, there were kingbirds, newly arrived from the tropics, sitting in the middle of my county road. And I knew they were eating earthworms, which is starvation food for kingbirds. They should not be eating that. Bluebirds do the same thing. Barn swallows will sit in the road and eat earthworms. Um, and I hate to see that, because I know that the next thing that they do is die if, they, if the weather doesn't turn. So when a bluebird has been feeding its young earthworms, this is what the nests look like. The babies get dysentery. They, can't, they don't form a fecal sac. The poop just spreads through the nest. So the babies are not only sick, they're wet and they're filthy. So I go into action when I see this and I start, first I replace the nest, I wash the babies off and then I, I, I you know, get them a clean nest and I start feeding them. This is the lunatic fringe of bluebirding. This is, this is like when you know too much and, and you know what's gonna happen. So I make bug omelet, which is a food that I learned to make from a rehabber in Canada. And she said, I'll give you the recipe, but I'll have to kill you if you share it. Because <laughs> she was writing a book, which I wound up illustrating, so it's all okay. Um, anyway, what you do is you, you scramble an egg with a little milk, and you grind up the shell and toast it in the oven. And you powder the shell. And then you add dried flies from Carolina Biological Supply. And you, um, I think this is a little video of me making it. Yeah. It would be nice if I knew how to run my yeah. stuff. So there's the ingredients. Okay, so here are the ingredients for bite omelet. We have... Um, this is worms. dried um, beta worms, blood worms. Ground eggshell. Egg Toasted in the oven first. And an egg. I've added a good pinch of ground eggshell. And now I'm going to make... Now we're going to fry that. And... At 5 a.m., this is not a smell you want to smell. It's not good, but it's really good. And you don't want to overcook it. You want it real moist when you give it to the babies. And it also smells really It smells nauseating, yes, it does. Curtis likes it, but... The mission here is to make some food with what I have on hand. Hence the blood worms meant for babies. Yeah, in a pinch you can use blood worms, but I like to use dried, dried domestic flies. Who are hurting right now because it has been cold. Yeah. Rainy. So we make our bug omelet and then we go to the nest boxes and we feed the babes. 
once you've done this, how can you not do it? Right? You know they're out there starving. You got to get out there. I mean, and it's it's really pretty wonderful to be able to give these things something to get them through. There's a nice fecal sac. We're getting that out of there. They're getting some food. But remember, it's 37 degrees. I've got these things on my lap. I'm feeding them. And, you know, I've got to get them fed and back in the box and the female back on there as fast as possible. It's, it is super not fun. It's, you know, it's really hard, but it is very satisfying to literally bring them back to life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. They can take enormous pieces. And I'm, I'm filming with my left hand and feeding with my right, which is why I'm so bad at this. But I'm, I'm really pretty good at it when I don't have to make a, a movie. <laughs> yeah. So that was what I was doing for three days before I came here. That's why I'm happy to be here. Um, this is a, a video that was made by Phoebe that's a lot more characteristic of how I actually work. They just aren't getting much to eat. He's still hungry. Still hungry. Oh, yeah. See, I think that'll do me. Yeah, maybe one more. So I'm imitating the bluebird's whistle to get it up in its bill. Okay, so I think I had 20, 22 babies or something I was feeding. <sighs> so you might ask, why don't I just put a bowl of mealworms on the roof? Wouldn't that be easier? The bluebirds will not feed mealworms to their babies until the babies are eight or nine days old. Because the babies can't digest the chitin on the mealworms, and the bluebirds know that. So, why don't you just put egg food on top of the box? The bluebirds don't recognize it as food. It's got to wiggle or they don't think it's food. So you can't do that. So you're stuck with hand feeding if the babies are younger than nine days old. And, uh, yeah. So that's why I hand feed the chicks. The next video is probably one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me in, in tending bluebirds. And I just actually repeated this. This is a box of babies who are 12 days old, which is, I call it the, the age of sentience, where these babies know that you're a human and you're dangerous and they don't want to see you and they're afraid of you. But these babies were so hungry and I had been feeding them for something like a week in, through this awful weather, that when I came up to the box, they begged for me. Look at that. And I'm just feeding them in the box. Isn't that crazy? They're treating me like mom. They know I'm the egg lady. And that I will give them what they need. Crazy, crazy stuff. May 6, 2020. So this kind of segues nicely into whether or not it's a good idea to feed bluebirds at all. And um, I feed bluebirds only when they need it, when they're going to die otherwise, right? Because I have had a ton of fun, make no mistake, with my Zikdo. I make it, I get this array of birds coming into my yard before I knew that I probably shouldn't be doing this during breeding season. Toeys, brown thrashers, chipping sparrows, hairy woodpeckers, you name it. But bluebirds are a special case because they're addictive personalities. Bluebirds will find a food source that's easy to exploit, and they will eat that to the exclusion of anything else. And that's unusual in the bird world. They don't seem to have much sense about food. So if you put out unlimited mealworms, what would happen? I asked that exact same question back in the 90s. And I had, well, no, winter 2009, yeah, I fed... Zikdo all winter and into the spring. And by the spring, both members of the pair of bluebirds in my yard were unable to use one of their feet. They were lame. And I knew enough to know that that was probably dietary. So I asked my avian vet, can birds get gout? And he said, yes, they certainly can. If they eat too much rich food, they can get gout, because I see it all the time in pet cockatiels, for instance, who are being fed table food. So I said, what can I do? And he said, withdraw the food, you know, just see what happens. So I withdrew the food, and this pathetic, swollen, red, inflamed toes and feet of these birds 
receded, and that's the same bird with, you know, with no zicto. Took several weeks, but she was fine. So this is the, this is the recipe, and you can kind of see what's going on here. Lard, mmm, is that something birds should be eating? Maybe not. Um, but this is the modified recipe, and I add the chick starter, which is an extruded pellet for growing chicks, basically. And this is a great food, but only in the winter. Only when it's really cold and they really, really need it. So lesson learned. And um, same with mealworms. Mealworms, people get hooked on feeding those to bluebirds, and they get hooked on feeding dried mealworms to the birds in their yard. But mealworms are super high in phosphorus and fat. And too much of a good thing is not a good thing. So save it for the cold weather. Um, yeah, in, in this, this time of year, I keep 3,000 mealworms on hand no matter what. You know, and I'm ready to order more. So I've gone through, uh, I've gone through 6,000 this spring. Lovely scene, but don't overdo it. And don't feed them in the summer. What happens if you feed bluebirds mealworms all summer, as many as they want? I wondered, so I did it when I was dumb and ignorant. And this is, this is a heavily worn male bluebird in August. You can see his feathers are so worn he looks like a female, right? There's almost no blue on top of his head. But it gets worse. In the summer of 1998, I fed my bluebird pair in the yard as many mealworms as they wanted, which a lot of people do. And they raised four broods of young in my yard, and they were exhausted and they looked awful and they failed to molt on schedule because they were working too hard to stop to molt. I did that. Um, this is what he looked like. He'd been given an all-you-can-eat buffet of mealworms all season long, all winter, all spring, all summer. So I show these pictures to show you that you know even experts do things wrong and to show you why you don't feed mealworms all summer long. So uh, they should be given as a treat, no more than eight worms per bird per day, and only when they need it. So how do bluebirds learn to self-feed? When, when, when do they pick up their own food? Um, bluebirds are in the nest for as long as 21 days. And um, we all see these life stages in the bluebird boxes, but what about after they leave the nest? So they pick up their first food when they're 25 to 28 days old, which is pretty old for a bird. You know, they've, it's a four-week-old bird finally picking up its own food. They don't really drop to the ground until they're 28 to 34 days old, drop to the ground to get prey and go back up to the perch to eat it. Uh, wild bluebirds feed their young then until they're day 35 to day 40. So I raised three bluebirds not long ago, um, which gave me a really nice look at their physiological development and, and their mental development, how those circuits get hooked up. And you may have seen this clip before, but it's pretty cute. Um, this is, starts with 32-day-old bluebirds just learning to pick up their own food. <laughs> what do I do with this? <laughs> Feed it to me! <laughs> an idea give it to me that would work I think I will eat it but I don't know how what if I took it from you <laughs> he's gonna eat it up oh, it's gone yeah so these are actually all three females, little babies that I raised. Look pretty good for hand-raised birds. Get it, get it, get it. Come on, come on, come on, come on get it, get it. Oh. Oh. So I give them another. Maybe it'll jump into my bill. This is such a classic bit. So cute. Okay, so that was day 34. Now here's day 46, and they have been released. They're flying free in my yard. Most excellent. And they're picking them up real good now. Oh my God. 
It's quite a thrill to have baby bluebirds land on your arm. So I set up these feeding stations around the yard so they can come and subsidize. I can subsidize them while they learn how to get other prey. I set them up on ladders. There you go. It's pretty cute. You are pretty. You are most pretty. Oops, hang on. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. Shoot. Anyway. Um, so it is a lot of work to provide for bluebirds. And if you do it the way I do it, it can be all-consuming. And if you get obsessed the way I am, it can actually be not real fun, you know, to, to really super take super good care of your birds. But it's worth it to me um, because I get to see things like this and like this. And I get to be part of their nesting cycle. I get to be part of their lives. Um, they truly light up our lives. And it's important never to forget that these birds are cavity nesters. And if we were to leave them alone, they would be nesting in cryptic holes in trees. And they would probably be better insulated and probably be less easily detected by predators than in these obvious as the nose on your face artificial boxes that we put up. So it's up to us to give them the best chance possible if we're going to invite them into these artificial structures, to feed them through hard times and perhaps be rewarded by a nest full of five females, which is equivalent to a basket of gold in my view. And this is what my yard sounded like last spring. Just bluebirds singing from every corner. Yard sounds like right now. There are bluebirds in every corner. There are also 13 boxes ready, clean, new, and waiting for them, or at least in good repair. Yeah, it's pretty satisfying. Um, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna work with these birds, you know, we owe it to them to do our best by them, and that's that's what I ask. And uh, I thank you so much for listening. So I would be more than happy to answer any questions that might have come up. Um, and I have the New River store here, as you can see. The most, the most merch of any speaker, probably. Um, oh, I'm getting a little feedback. Um, but I'm going to try and set up my store again. Dell, would you help me kind of reconstruct this? Yeah. Put it back yeah, put it back together since I tore it apart. Um, if I could, uh, yeah, take any questions. Anybody got any burning questions about? Right here. Yeah, house bearers. We had done to a uh, uh, service on bluebirds several months ago. Uh huh. And they told us they said if you've got house bearers, you shouldn't even put boxes up. <laughs> That's house bearers everywhere, as far as I know. So. Yeah, well, that's actually a really good point. Um, if you have bad sparrow problems, if you have, let's say, neighbors with chickens who are feeding grain or horses or a farm nearby with a big hayloft, you know, that is basically a sparrow factory, it's not really fair to put up bluebird boxes because you're just going to bring the bluebirds into a situation of conflict with the house sparrows. Then you can get into the whole nasty cycle of trapping house sparrows en masse and drowning them in the trap and then setting the trap out again, and that's bad for your soul. Um, so I kind of agree with that. But you're right, there are house sparrows anywhere, everywhere. But you can select box designs such as the very shallow chickadee box that I showed you that house sparrows don't like. They also don't like those birch bark looking thin wall PVC boxes because they let in more light. House sparrows like a deep, dark nest cavity. You can try sparrow spookers, which are made uh, a dowel with mylar strips on it that you put on the back of the box, and the strips wave in the wind, and house sparrows don't like that. Some people swear by monofilament lines running from the edge of the roof down to the bottom of the box, three or four in a row, which the, the bluebirds will navigate through, but the house sparrows get spooked by. So there are any number of tricks that you can try. 
Um, I have very little trouble with house sparrows, but then I throw them out the second they try to build in my boxes, and I try to kill the incubating female and the male if I can. So you have to be, you know, it's one of those things. It's like you have to deal in death to a certain extent to deal in life. Yeah. Yes? Is there any benefit for um, the screening to put in some of the boxes? For, for, the, 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 blow, for, for the blowflies? Yeah. No. Mm -mm. People say, you know, oh, I just put a screen in the bottom of the box. But the thing is, is that blowflies occur throughout the nest at all levels. So they're, most of them are right under the cup. Most of them never even make it down to the bottom of the box. So a screen in the bottom isn't going to help significantly. Yes? How far can the squirrel go? Yeah, 100 feet. I try to get them 100 feet out from the nearest tree. And what the trick I use is I try to put the box, if I have to put the box near a tree, I make sure it's a low one. Like the higher the tree, of course, the longer the trajectory. So. Um, so far, so good, but I honestly don't know if I have any meadows on my place that are big enough to be safe from flying squirrels. So it's kind of trial and error. It's, it's, it's idiosyncratic to each location. You know, it's like you do your best. You try to get it as far away from trees as possible, and you hope that the, the flying squirrels don't key onto it. I was asking for it in retrospect because my boxes were all on the edge of woodlands. So at some point, a flying squirrel is going to get curious, land on the roof, look inside, say, oh, look, there's a bird nest in here. Huh, candy, yeah. Yeah, so that's what happened. And, and the other thing is that when you have a trail up for 30 years and the boxes are in the same place, the predators are all like, well, let's try this in year eight, you know? So that's my problem. People are say, oh, I had great success. My boxes are all on trees in my yard. Well, how long have they been up? Two years. Yeah. You just wait. Yeah, so... Right there. Oh yes, I've had severe conflict. I've had a female bluebird killed by tree swallows. Yeah, yeah. When they hatched. Yeah, Have yeah. Ever I've never seen that, no. Mm -mm. I'm yeah. not entirely sure of that. But yeah. Weird stuff happens when yeah. we put up artificial nesting cavities. Yeah, yeah, right here. Yeah, they will do that too. Yeah, especially a tree-mounted nest box. That's their favorite. Yeah. This was on a power pole. Uh, power pole, yeah. And the higher the better for them. Yeah. I, I, when I was a kid in Virginia, we had uh, flying squirrels in one box, and my dad would, would lift the lid, and we'd look in and see these little eyes. I mean, I had no idea that they would be my super predator when I was, you know, in my 60s. Yes? At what age does a baby bluebird have enough feathers that if the mama Right. That dad, since he doesn't have a brood patch. Right. Yeah, the, the, the bluebirds tend to stop brooding their young when the young begin to feather out at about day eight or nine. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they're, they can thermoregulate well enough in a normal year, you know, but like, uh, I had a box uh, of 11 day old babies who were no longer being brooded in this weather. And they were, doing very poorly until I started really super powering, you know, feeding them. And then they did okay. If they can stay supplied with food, they can stay warm. But yeah, yeah, if you lose the female bluebird and the babies are less than eight days old, they're probably going to die unless you foster them into another box, even if the male is there to care for them. Yes? No, I don't. I don't have a permit. No. Yeah. No, I didn't interrupt the feeding of the parents because the parents yeah. couldn't find anything. Yeah. No, you, no, you, all right. Well, the, yeah. well the, the parents started out feeding them? 
Oh, yeah. And the parents were feeding them, but on such a low level that they were dying. Okay. And yeah. so they were getting most of their nutrition from you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then the weather changed and you left, and the parents would just resume as though... The parents had been feeding them straight through. I was s simply supplementing. Oh, okay. But the parents were feeding them bits of earthworm, you know, and slugs and whatever they could find. And so I was coming by every few hours and just stuffing them full like you saw in the videos. And then the parents were like, oh, these babies look great and they're making fecal sacs. How wonderful, you know. And uh, yeah, so the parents at that point, their main function is just to keep them warm, you know. And these birds are not afraid of me. You know, I drive up, they're like, oh, she's here. Great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, more worms. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I do. I'm not really interrupting. I'm more augmenting. So I'm certainly not, you know, keeping them from caring for their babies. Yeah, yeah. Do you know when the baby birds are full, or do they stop eating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They will. I mean, if I keep whistling and they won't open, you know, then I know. But sometimes, like, like right before I left, I had one feeding at 1:30 before I left to pick up Ann at the airport, and I, I fed them all egg food, and then I, like, I had a, a syringe of warm formula, and I squirted each one full of formula on top of the egg food. And I was like, this is going to have to hold you for a while. And I, I'm pretty confident that they're all going to be alive when I get back, because the weather then began to warm that evening. And by the next morning at about 10.30 in the morning, it was in the 50s. And they're golden then. But it was nip and tuck, and I was like, I actually considered, like, if it was going to be in the 30s or 40s and raining for another day, I, I considered saying to Jeff, won't be leading the trip on Thursday, going to be feeding the babies, you know. You're going to need to pick Ann up at the airport in Charleston. <laughs> but thank God. No kidding. She's worth it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was hairy. It was, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm sleeping so much better here than I was at home. Uh, anyway, don't want to hold you captive. Come up and buy things, please, so I don't have to take it home. Thank you. Thank you. Stay close. I need to mic. Oh, okay. So uh, Paul Shaw has some lights set up for mothing, and he's going to tell you a quick bit on that and uh, feel free to pounce on the store well as uh, weather is dictated all week we had to kind of do things uh, in as the weather dictated so uh, we finally got a, a night where we could put lights up they're on the back of the uh, hot tub gazebo um, right on the wall there's no sheet uh, it's very bright you don't want to stare into the lights uh, it's just that same thing don't stare in the sun um, but there may be uh, some moths in the next 30 minutes. Uh, it's probably going to be a slow night, to be honest. I, I can tell by the conditions. By midnight, those could, the wall would be covered, but I know that none of you want to be here that long. But um, anyway, it's just a little extension, and if you do want to hang out for a few minutes, at least until like 9.15 or 9.20, we could bring in a, sil I mean, a, a Luna moth or... Uh, they come in oftentimes really early. So anyway, hang out if you choose or go take a long nap. And it's been a great week, y'all. We're going to wrap up tomorrow. All right, here you go. Jeff, sign off. Please. Good night, folks. Thanks for joining us on Facebook Live. We'll see you tomorrow from Summit Bechtel Reserve around 830. Thank you.